Welcome back to this episode of the Women and Money Cafe. Now today, Michelle and myself, I've got a guest with us. We need to thank one of the listeners for this guest, Jolene. Jolene was sitting in, I think it was Charles de Gaulle Airport a month or two back. And she got chatting to this woman and she messaged me straight afterwards saying, you need to have her on the podcast. You need to have her on. I was like, well, I'm intrigued now. So she put me in touch with Katie and we've been messaging back and forth. And I'm delighted today to have Katie Crooks, the artist hypnotherapist with us today. So hi there, Katie. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Good to be here. All right. So this is exciting. And Michelle, thank you for being with me today as well. No, no, you're welcome. It's lovely as always. All right. So Jolene dropped me a message, but just singing your praises, Katie. And then you and I were messaging back and forth about all the kind of things that you do and the work that you do. And I was like, oh, wow, this sounds so cool. And then before we started record, Michelle and I were talking about some of the things you specialize in. And the two things that came up were imposter syndrome and self-sabotage, to which our response was, oh, that's great. We can do both of them. So I hope be like over the next 30 minutes or so you're going to share with us some of your pearls of wisdom. But just to get us started, tell us a little bit more about yourself, Katie. Well, I started out as a singer, performer, dancer, actor, and realized pretty much from day one that my soul was calling me to be a voice coach. And so I taught voice and singing for 20 years. And the whole time I was watching these artists just sabotage their voices in the studio, in the rehearsal studio, actors in rehearsal and in my own performance because I ran a swing band up until quite recently. Still love getting on stage and singing and performing myself. And I saw so much limitation on people's voices and I became really interested in things like how trauma was affecting people's physical voices that I started to go deeper into what was actually causing people's blockage on themselves. And then I started to, I just, I, I had to go deeper. So that's why I became a hypnotherapist. Okay. Now, I know you mentioned this when we were messaging. And one of the things that popped into my head was, oh, I want to know more about this. Because I know that some of the conversations we've had in the past in the podcast, we did an episode on asking for a pay rise and just mm-hmm. handling difficult situations. I thought, I wonder how our voice is affecting our success or lack of success in this area. So can you tell me a little bit more about how people self-sabotage with their voice? Oh my gosh. Well, rewind to about 250,000 years ago. And if you, if you, I know, go, go with me on this one. Trust my bonkers way. If you actually imagine we were hanging out in caves or mud huts or something um, when we all started out evolving on the African plains and we survived by being with our tribe, right? And if we weren't in a tribe, our chances of survival were much, much lower. We'd probably get chased through the, the jungle through by a tiger or something like that or attacked by another tribe. And so we did everything in our power. We evolved to do everything in our power to stay with the tribe. And so if we got up in front of the, the tribe by the campfire and sang our song or spoke our piece and we were rejected, we risk death. And that's why the nervous system goes into that fight flight response quite frequently when we're about to use our voice, when we're about to speak up and say, I don't like this, I want a pay rise, or I don't like what that leader said. Our nervous system is still trying to do what it was doing 250,000 years ago to keep us alive. And so it's not the fear is not rational. It's, it's completely, it's our amygdala in our brain it only knows two settings. Either I'm safe or I'm going to die. It only knows those. And so that's why it shuts the voice down to stop you effectively dying. That's how dramatic it is. Wow. <laughs> My <laughs> tiny mind has just been blown. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. It's public speaking and using your voice is up there with fear of death in terms of the things that people with clients come for come for sessions for oh you have you have literally just blown my mind because I'm trying to think <laughs> back yeah but years ago I had a job where I had to give lots of presentations and I had zero experience of this and it was utterly terrifying so yeah you might as well have put a saber-toothed tiger in the room right yeah 
And what I can distinctly remember doing is forgetting to breathe until about three yes. minutes in, and at which point I realized, mm -hmm. okay. And the other yeah. thing I can remember doing is there was a word that I would use repeatedly to the point where it's probably quite annoying. I don't know. It was like a comfort word. Oh, oh. what? Like, like, okay. It's my word. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now every it. listener is going to be listening out for how many times I say okay in a podcast. <laughs> so am I, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Filler words. Filler words are there to... To, to comfort you and to fill the space when we're not comfortable with the silence. But the silence is actually where the most powerful places lie. Because when you allow silence, you allow what you've said to land. And the listeners go, ah, oh, okay. And they feel safe with you. If I, don't, coach. if I don't feel safe, I'm going to be asking okay all the time because I'm looking for reassurance. But I'm giving a presentation, they're not meant to be talking back at me. Oh, good point. Okay. <laughs> <Let's>... <laughs> well, I think it's, this is just really interesting, this whole what's going on in our brains when we're doing things like this. So when we find ourselves in a situation where we have to speak up for something mm -hmm. or, we, or we feel the need to speak up and what's going, what's going on underneath. Yeah. Will you add on to that all of the times you were probably told as a child, don't ask for more, be quiet. Don't be noisy. Ask nicely if you want that thing. No, you can't have that. Oh, oh, I'm not made of money. Money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, what else were we programmed as, as children to believe? Oh, yeah, money's dirty. I know a lot of people who subconsciously let go or, or make terrible investments because they have a subconscious belief that money is dirty. Money is the root of all evil. We're programmed with all these belief systems constantly and, well, as children particularly. And what we have to do is is unpick those belief systems that we had that we've had playing as records in our brain for you know 30 40 50 odd years did i go off on a tangent then i'm adhd i go on to epic tangents oh no no we, we like a tangent <laughs> i didn't think that was a good. tangent but we're no strangers to a tangent okay, no okay great <laughs> yeah so, I'm, I'm just curious then when we find ourselves in a situation and let's let's use the example of say asking for a pay rise or asking about promotion. Um, what's going on physiologically with us before we actually start to open our mouths? Yeah, a number of things happen when the when the body goes. I mean, this is assuming we haven't done the subconscious work and healed the subconscious belief systems. So if if we know you're safe, then the parasympathetic nervous system is activated and that's the one that is rest and digest but if you're in the ah and being chased by a saber-toothed tiger that's the activated um, sympathetic nervous system when we're in that space a number of things happen usually sweaty palms we start either we just don't breathe like you described or we breathe higher up here another thing that happens and this is my past life as a voice coach coming out now because I'm full hypnotherapist now but all that voice background our larynx our voice box will often go a lot higher because it's getting ready to yell in emergency which is in musical theater we call it belting that high wah, belt sound which is great on stage if you want to go to the western stage not great when you're in the boardroom or when you want to ask for a pay rise so our abs kick in our, they often grip our psoas muscle contracts, which is the muscle in our muscles in our core, which are all about the fight flight system, and that the response is basically your system is getting ready to run away or get into a fight because that's what our primal selves are doing. So yeah, we can't think straight because when when you, we go into that high stress state, our brain waves they're not in the relaxed alpha brainwave state which is a nice daydreamy state in that state you get your best ideas you can think clearly you can remember stuff that you you know couldn't usually remember you, know, you can remember your lines your text your presentation easily when you're in alpha brainwaves but when we're stressed we can't get into that in the zone state very easily the brain's too busy just doing the basic minimum to stay alive does that make sense it does 
It does. Mm. So you know what my next question is going to be. How do I stop it doing that so that I can be <laughs> totally chilled? And by the way, I am so worth the 15 grand pay rise. Ah, yes. Well, there are, there are a number of things that you, I think, that needs to happen. And in my experience, and this is why I tend to work with clients longer than just one-off sessions, is, but it's amazing what you can change with when you start working with your unconscious, your subconscious mind. What you need to do is, one, is to train your nervous system to be calm in those moments. But what you really need to do, I believe, is actually heal or shift or clear the subconscious beliefs that are telling you you can't have that pay rise. And this is where we get into the subconscious programming side because when up until about the age of seven or so, some people say nine, different research says different things, but kind of around the age of seven, our brain waves are basically in theta, which is a deeply relaxed state. I'll explain the brain waves for a moment. So we've got alpha, sorry, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Delta is sleep and beta is highly alert, focused, conscious, aware. When you go into alpha or theta, these two in the middle, that's when you're daydreamy or you're deeply relaxed. And that's when you have your best, best ideas and so on. Now, when we're children, the brain hasn't developed to have the, the top bit, the beta bit developed yet. So we don't have the ability to bat away those beliefs that people gave us. So for example, if Imagine, let's say you're four years old and you've put up your hand in class and the primary school teacher has, or you've said something like given an answer to the question and the teacher has slammed you down and said, no, that was wrong. You're really silly. Or that was a stupid thing to say. And what that does is it, it sows a tiny neural pathway in the brain of that four-year-old and a few, a few neurons stick together and create this little dirt track, little pathway. And what happens then is if there are a few more occasions where let's say a kid on the playground goes, oh, you sound stupid when you sing, or a sibling says, shut up, or a parent says, oh, be quiet. I can't concentrate. I'm trying to do a Zoom call or whatever it is. Then that compounds and it strengthens the neural pathways in the brain and neurons that fire together wire together and it becomes a belief system. I refer to B belief systems as BS. Because they are, they're BS, they're stories, they're not truths. They really are a load of bullshit. They're not truths. They're just stories that you've told yourself based on a number of experiences that have compounded to give you these stories that you've been carrying around. But the thing is, they're not actually your stories. They're not your truths. Your truth is someone who is expressive, gifted in certain things, has curiosity, creativity. I think we're all born with creativity. So any person who says, oh, I'm not creative, I think that's BS because we all have to think creatively, even if it's to get creative when we build a spreadsheet. I really think that because I've seen that. So we grow up with all these belief systems and then we believe that that's the truth. And so then when we get to our boss and we start to say, can I have the pay rise? We don't have conscious idea that we don't consciously know that we've got this old subconscious program running because it probably happened when we were so young. We probably don't remember. But there's this old neural pathway, these old neural pathways, which by now have become six lane motorways in our brain that say, don't speak up, don't speak up. You'll get ridiculed. You'll get shamed. You'll get slammed down. And for women, it's even more because we've not been programmed as much until quite recently to ask for money or to want more to say, no, I'm going to put my stake in the ground and say, actually, I am worth this. I deserve this pay rise. And so we're consciously trying to, to speak up and say it, but everything about our subconscious is saying, no, that's not you. I'm on these, these old pathways, these motorways in my brain. And, and so it's very, very difficult to use the conscious part of your brain to push through those belief systems because the conscious part of your brain is only 5%. Your subconscious runs 95% of the show. It runs how you breathe, how you move, your tone of voice impulsively, 
that the fact that I've just tensed up my left shoulder and I wasn't conscious of it until I saw myself <laughs> in the video. You know, <laughs> we unconsciously do so many things. That was a lot of me talking. No, it was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I like this concept of the motorways. My last therapist used to refer to it as sheep trails, but that could be because she yeah. was from the Highlands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, no, it is. It's, yeah. it's a bloody motorway now. So, Michelle, I'm just curious right. as you're listening to Katie talk, there's <laughs> like, we were saying, like, we've signed up for this whole self sabotage thing, haven't we? Imposter syndrome. What are your mm. thoughts? What's going through your head as you listen to Katie talk? Well, I just listened to Katie sort of actually describe probably my head, really, to be fair, <laughs> <laughs> with with the motorways and everything. And, and actually, because public speaking is something that I and Julie knows how I feel about public speaking, something I am not good at doing or confident with doing. And it took a lot of coercion, I think, to even get me to be on a video on here. So, <laughs> well, good on you. It's, and it's, that's it's getting it past it. Yeah, it's getting yeah. past it. But actually... I've always been really interested in the subconscious and why my subconscious mm. does what it does because it has a lot to answer for, to be fair. So it's it, right. It's just fascinating. I it's just, fascinating. and that's why I was speechless when you said about the first example about, you know, obviously to keep yourself alive. I've never thought mm. of it like that. No, it's basic survival systems because your subconscious is always going to do everything in its power to do what it thinks is for your highest and greatest good. Mm. So if you're, Subconscious, unconscious, I use those two words interchangeably. If your unconscious mind believes it's helping you by not letting you ask for the pay rise, it's going to keep making you stop using your voice. But, and this is a massive but, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, I think a lot of people, one of my favorite phrases is a lot of people argue in favor of the problem. They keep compounding the problem by talking about why it isn't working. And, oh, I have this subconscious belief and and then talking it, talking it through. But actually, I say don't talk it through too much because all you're doing is, is strengthening those, those sheep tracks. You're strengthening the motorways. What you've got to do is start to, to really start to move into a new identity, the new version of you, and, and release those old stories, those old belief systems from your subconscious. So every time that I'm choosing a new story, I'm not going to talk about that old belief system. I'm going to talk about who I choose to be. Identity is really important for the subconscious. I am someone who loves speaking up more and more every day. If you say that, your brain has just created a little tiny new neurological pathway. And the more you interrupt your flow of story, of, of talking about the old BS, the more you put a roadblock in front of that old sheep track and your brain will naturally start to create new neural pathways, new sheep tracks that actually are ones that you want. So that's why I'm such a big advocate for going into hypnosis, using hypnotherapy, because you're deprogramming, you're dehypnotizing yourself of these old stories, these kind of webs of belief systems that have been stuck on you that are not actually you. They're not your truth. Your truth underneath it is way more amazing than that. So when you actually deprogram yourself, you take these things off, almost like old costumes you've been wearing that aren't yours, hmm. then you can start standing up and saying, this is what I want. Oh, by the way, as a hypnotherapist, I understand that this, the brain works in metaphor and analogy, imagery, weird, wacky stuff, you know, rainbows and unicorns and, and all sorts of cool stuff. So if I start talking about things in metaphor, I know it's because you might not consciously understand it, but your unconscious mind totally gets it because that's its language. I'm not afraid. I, I actually don't find this at all weird because I'm thinking about a coach that I work with that uses NLP and EFT. Yeah. Oh, she's working. Amazing. And some of the crazy stuff she's had me coming out with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, so what is it? Well, it's an orange ball in one hand. And what's in the other hand? There's a little gray spiky thing. And <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. Oh, you give me tingles when you say that. Yeah. The subconscious <laughs> is just... It, it's our intuition. It's our gut feeling. You know, that, that full body feeling that says, right, this is a yes. This is what I want in my career. And it's only the ego mind that tries to keep us small and say, oh, no, don't do that. Or, or what, what will people think? But there's this inner knowing that I want this thing. And it's a full body yes. And you can feel it intuitively. And the more you work with people in this context, the more you actually get really good at feeling and sensing what's actually right for you. And what your brain is telling you is totally off. So you're mm. negotiating with your subconscious with this work. You're not 
forcing it to believe something it doesn't want to believe. You're actually working with it and negotiating with your unconscious mind to create those new neural pathways. All right, so trying to put this into context then because I can think of numerous <laughs> occasions where I've just felt some I've just felt something I just know that something yeah. has to yeah. happen in my core and it's yeah. then once I start thinking about it that the problems occur and oh. I know something and then once yeah. I start thinking about it that's when I start to find problems or get in my own way so is this kind of the self-sabotage pattern beginning well I see it two ways. How can I put this? I see it as in the conscious mind, like you know, you'll have a subconscious, an idea, a, a, an instinct, a thought, of, oh, yeah, that feels really good. And then the, the conscious mind, the critical part of the brain wants to shred it and say, no, that's not going to work. That's a rubbish idea. Blah, blah, blah. The, you know, the voices. But I also think if you have a record playing in your unconscious mind that was given to you by, a, you know, primary school teacher or a caregiver, then that can also be a program that you need to change. So there's the conscious interference. Mm -hmm. And when you go deeper, you can actually discover what the record is that's been playing in your mind, that's been saying, no, oh, you can't have that. And then you can actually change the record by going deeper, deeper into a more relaxed state where you can allow your unconscious to open up and, and have these changes. Did that answer the question? It kind of gave two answers. It yeah? does. I'm curious, Michelle, because obviously everybody now knows that I'll overuse the word okay when I'm feeling <laughs> insecure. <laughs> I think it's only fair that you share. Is there any of the records that are playing in your head that you feel comfortable sharing with us? <laughs> There's definitely the speaking to more than one or two people. You know, I... I can probably do the, the sweaty palm bit feeling rather nauseous and not, and definitely not breathing comes into mind. And I tend to play with my hands a lot and I, I don't quite know what to do with myself because I then think everyone's looking at me. They all wonder what the hell I'm talking about. Do I need to just shut up or should I just carry on? And, and, I, and then I end up in this sort of circular state of what am I doing? You know, and then and that's and the next time I go, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> oh yeah so, and yeah. yet you have so much more to give do you know what subconscious beliefs slip under the radar until until they come up for us ready to clear i found one last week that this is a slight tangent but it is relevant because it just proves that these these subconscious belief systems uh, we find them and go oh i didn't realize you were there little fucker <laughs> what were you doing there <laughs> So I went to, a few weeks ago, I went to see a hypnotherapist because I wanted to get into my pre-lockdown wardrobe. I've got a gorgeous wardrobe full of lovely clothes that I used to wear with my swing band. And when I was singing on stage, I, none of them have been fitting right now. So I thought, okay, I want to lose that stone and get back to where I was. And the first thing I had to release, subconscious belief, was, well, you're doing all right. You don't need to. And then I went, actually, no, no, I'll, fuck it. I'm going to claim this one. Actually, I do want to release this. So that was the first thing I had to work with. And then I had a hypnotherapy session and I discovered right down there in my unconscious mind that I had been wearing this extra, just this little layer of extra frump that I didn't need. And I knew full well I didn't need it to be carrying it around. It wasn't loads, just a bit in order to, to stay just that little bit invisible so I didn't get unwarranted comments from men unconsciously hiding from getting you know those kind of those kind of comments <laughs> that we as women have, have witnessed I was protecting myself when I changed that what happened in that hypnotherapy session is my conscious mind and my subconscious mind sort of went and they, they don't actually make that sound but in my head they do and it the two and two came together and my brain went, oh, well, now I know that I can start to actually release those extra pounds, which is what I've been doing. And it's been working really successfully. And I haven't been depriving myself. I haven't been. I, but what I realized, and this is the irony of it, is that I currently have a program out, which we started yesterday, actually called Fearlessly Visible. 
And I show people how they can clear the subconscious programs which have been limiting their voice and their self-expression and their ability to be seen and be heard. And there I was with this undercurrent subconscious programming that I had been hiding. I had been hiding my own visibility by wearing a few extra layers of fat cells that I just didn't really need to be carrying around. Wow. Blew my <laughs> mind. So, of course, naturally, me being me, I went on Instagram and did a live about it and talked about it and said, hey, guys, <laughs> still working on my own shit. <laughs> Do what, look, thank you for sharing that with us, Katie, because I think that's really in the spirit of the podcast, because we're all about owning up to all the things that we're not perfect at. We don't have all our money shit together. And oh, so it's yeah. really reassuring when people turn up as guests and they're like, you know what, this is what I'm really good at. This is something I'm still working on. Yeah. Yeah. And it can change. And that's the thing. It can yeah. change, you know. So money story. And this is where, uh, wow, I'm on a soapbox about that because I've dealt with a lot of money stories where I learned um, that things like parents saying, no, you can't have that toy. Money doesn't grow on trees. I'm not made of money. You can't have everything you want. That creates all these neural pathways in our brain that then we unconsciously go for jobs that aren't as high paid as they, as, as we deserve because there's this old program running in our brain that doesn't need to be there. And I discovered someone I know, a person who knows someone I know, let's say that for confidentiality, would make a lot of money, but then lose it. They would, they would, and they were in very much stuck in this lack mindset with money. And it turns out when they actually uncovered it, that it was a belief that, oh, that money's dirty. Mm. And I want to get, I want to get rid of it. So even though I can make it, they would just naturally get rid of it. And it was a belief system. They were probably told as a child, oh, don't pick up that, that coin on the ground because it's filthy. Or maybe it was something else like, oh, those, those nasty bankers, they get all the money. <laughs> and it turns it into an us and them. And if you think about all the cartoons and, and programs, okay, take super, uh, not uh, Spider-Man and Peter Parker's grandfather, he says a line in, in one of the films. It's something like, well, we may be poor, but we're kind. Oh, so, so what that's doing is it's saying, oh, you, you can either be kind and poor or rich and a baddie. What a load of BS. I've learned now, and here's a really pow powerful reframe for everyone. I learned this from a brilliant entrepreneur called Scott Olford in the US. And this is brutal, but it's really, really powerful. You, you oh gosh, this is going to sound really horrendous. I'm going to say it anyway. You don't <laughs> see, ah, oh, I feel like a bad person. No, but I'm a good person because I'm teaching something really helpful here. It's you don't see the names of poor people on the donations list of a new hospital wing. What I mean by that is you cannot make yourself poor enough to help, other, to help poor people. When you say, I'm earning money in order to lift the world up, that's completely different from saying, I want to make money because I'm, you know, Oh, but then I can't make money because that makes me the bad guy. Actually, what if choosing to be abundant in your life makes you the good guy, person, the good one instead? I like that. I yeah. Do. Okay. So it's, it's that reframing. It's, it's detaching it away from like money as for bad people. Yeah. But money is money is a means that I can do good in the world. Yes, because your subconscious mind will never let you become something you despise. So if you go around despising or judging people who earn lots of money, you're telling your subconscious mind, oh, I'm not one of those people. But with the best will in the world, Katie, I still don't like bankers. <laughs> and if that's my subconscious mind preventing ah. me from ever being a banker, I'm cool with that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So here's the thing. money. And bankers are two separate things. You can love money, but still have a problem with bankers. Do you, do you see where I think a lot mm. of people have been putting their, yeah. And also, and I'm constantly saying this to myself, you know, if I have a launch that hasn't gone how exactly I want it to go and I've been too attached to the outcome and selling from the wrong energy and then and blah, blah, blah. I'll, I'll always say to myself, well, 
there's always new ways to make money. Mm. There's always a new way. And so, yeah, I'm just consistently saying that to my subconscious mind. There's always great ways to make money. There's always valuable ways to make money where I'm giving something of value to the world. And, and yeah, money, money flows. Okay. I think one of the other things I wanted to ask you to talk to us a little bit about is because I think we, we've kind of covered self-sabotaging and the different ways that might pop up. And I know mm. that from chatting with the listeners and just in our own circles, another popular topic that comes up time and time again is imposter syndrome. Oh, I wondered syndrome. what your thoughts were on that. Well, oh, such a good, it's such a juicy topic. How many times do you think you learned in your life and particularly childhood that you didn't you weren't quite good enough to be there for example didn't didn't make it into the school play or didn't make it into the top set in maths or did make it to the top set in maths and then went to senior school and found yourself actually not as good as the top kid in school mm-hmm. or went to university and discovered that you were brilliant at everything until a certain point and actually you just turned out to be media. So, so we get these lessons it's just drip beating us so frequently of, of not good enough, not good enough, or not enough, or I have to be better. And I'm going to own up and say when I was a voice, speech and singing teacher, I was teaching an unbelievably good professionals who are now on the West End stage. And I'm so proud of them. And it was great to be doing that. But I used to be so fixated on what could improve with them that I forgot to actually just say, well, yeah, of course you're good enough. You're at one of the top drama schools in the country and you work hard. You deserve to be here. And so, but I didn't realize that at the time because I wasn't conscious like I am now as a therapist. But I saw so much of this, this I'm not good enough, this imposter syndrome, and even more so in the women. And I think it's because so often women and girls are, are encouraged to be more cautious when they climb the climbing frame and boys are told, be the superhero, go on, you can do it. And girls are told, oh, be careful, don't mess your dress up. I mean, I was told that a lot, you know, don't, don't climb that tree. Oh, you're a bit of a tomboy if you climb the tree. And so I, a lot of that programming had sunk in that makes us feel, well, it doesn't, I'm going to rephrase that. Nothing can make you feel anything that we perceive as giving us a feeling of not enoughness. And it's a subconscious program. And actually everyone gets imposter syndrome at every level. I've seen people win big TV competitions and get the gigs and be going out to stadiums to see, to, to perform in front of thousands of people and will be on the phone in the, what's it, tour bus, you know, and, and we'll be doing a hypno session and we'll be working on releasing this fear of being good enough. And then they'll go on stage and smash their performance. It's crazy. Right. I think that's interesting that everybody has this at some point. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah. Michelle, it's not just you and me. No. We haven't, we haven't got a duopoly on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, I've had to I've had to deal with with a lot of imposter syndrome as I've moved out of the identity of being a, a struggling artist into the identity of being a self-employed, a highly capable self-employed person, and now into the identity of business owner. And I'm just shifting. I'm just looking into shifting from being a sole trader into being a. See, I'm still learning about this stuff. Limited company, you know. Thank you. Limited company. You're welcome. Looking at char- char- <laughs> thank you. Char- charging VAT and things like that. And so I've had to really step up and say, you know what? And I've had to tell my nervous system, I can hold more. You can hold more. You're safe holding more. Because, you know, the first time I asked for a certain price point, my heart was going like, just boom, boom, boom. What if they say no? And I went, well, what if they do say no? You're not going to die. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got food. You've got food in the fridge. No one's going to die. <laughs> There's no saber toothed tiger. <laughs> there is, and isn't it remarkable that they haven't been around for a while, but we all keep being prepared for them. <laughs> Very are not, interesting. Not real tigers, which do actually exist. So I'm just curious, Michelle. This imposter syndrome thing has it ever has it ever popped into your head? 
yes, as you know. <laughs> and, and I think you actually made me think of a conversation I had with someone that I, I work with and we were talking about setting hourly rates and, and how you sort of price for work and things. And I can remember him saying to me and I said, well, I can't charge that because that's that's just too high that you know I can't do that so I'll charge that and he said well why can't you sort of charge that figure I said because I'm telling people really what they already know and he sort of looked at me and he said well what do you mean I said well if I can know it and understand it well then they can because clearly you know I'm not no more special than anyone else so mm. I, you know they can and he just looked at me and he went you have no idea and just walked off and left me and I was just sort of sat there like yeah. No. Well, where shall I price it? He went, I'm not even having the conversation with you now. I'm just going to walk away from you because I can't believe you just said that to me. <laughs> yeah. And can you hear how that's just the conscious mind trying to argue and, and make sense of what's going mm. on? Because there's this underlying belief that somehow you're not good enough or not allowed to, to own your abilities. And it's that thing, as you said, you know, if someone says no, they say no. And actually, that's okay. People can say no. And, you know, I, I'm also the nature, you don't want to upset anybody. So I don't want them to say no. I want them yeah. to say yes. So you have this don't kind of upset. ongoing battle, I presume, don't you, that you're, you're trying to please different parts of your mind, which is why I find the mind actually sometimes really annoying. But it's mm. just... <laughs> just trying to help. The mind is just trying to help. But, you know, what you've, you've picked up a really important piece there, this people-pleasing trying to make others pleased and be pleasing and be nice. And I, so often we're, we're brought up to be sweet, be nice, use our voices nicely, be ni play nicely, be nice children. And we, then we learn, oh, I have to be nice, I have to be pleasing, I can't be assertive, I can't, you know, because I might, I might piss someone off. But the truth is, no matter what you do in life, you're going to piss someone off. Yeah. You know, not everyone... Some people, uh, I've got blue hair, by the way, you know, some people love my blue hair and some people <laughs> probably can't stand it. And either way, it's actually nothing to do with me. That's so important. It's never to do with you. Yeah. No, that's been, uh, Katie, it's been so fascinating chatting with you. And I think I did say I was going to share one of the things that I noticed on your website that I just want to read out for the listeners because uh, there's a lot in this. And on your website, it says, because when you know that you are valid and worthy of being heard, you go from, I don't think I can do this, to, I love this and can't wait to share it with the world. And I just think, how many times in a day do we all say to ourselves, I don't think I can do this? Oh. I know that I say it a lot in my head throughout <laughs> the day, and I, I don't think it's just me. And if what we if could... You yeah, yeah. Stop if, the story. Uh -huh, if we replace that with "I love this and I can't wait to share it with the world," would how different would life be? Oh, how abundant! Would you, how how would you feel in yourself, in your skin? All of this stuff comes down to self worth, self belief, self confidence. When you have this deep inner knowing that you're valuable, that your voice is valid, that you are truly valuable then you won't take things personally anymore. You'll never take a no personally. And you'll recognize that, you know, successful business owners have just failed more times. Mm. They've just got, you know, to get there. And that's okay. And then nothing, you don't take anything personally when you know you are valid and valuable. Oh, wow. Successful business owners are just people that have failed more times. I absolutely bloody love that. It's like taking away the shame of failure. Right. Yeah. Now, I, I cannot remember who I learned that. I heard someone say it, who repeated it from someone who said it from some. It was one of those whispers thing. So I, can't, I cannot credit who said that, but it wasn't me. I heard it somewhere and it just blew my mind. I love it. It's very powerful. Very powerful reframe. Yeah. All right. Well, just as we draw things to a close here, I'm just wondering, Michelle, if you've got any sort of last reflections that you want to share with the listeners. Oh, I just, well, I think you have kind of blown my mind, to be fair, Katie, because you kind of sort of talked about things in a different way from what you see in books and what you usually hear. And actually, 
understanding it a bit more about the motorways and, you know, the saber-toothed tigers, I think it changes it and actually helps you to understand it more. So, no, it's been it's been brilliant because I'm going to go away now and think about all the times that I've done things and what can I do? <laughs> yeah, yes. More importantly, what can I do instead now? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. Stop, stop the story. Stop the track and create a new one. I think one of the things for me as well is just you, you haven't explained the brain waves. I'm like, oh, I want to try and get myself in that beta wave zone a little bit more. Is that where I want to yeah. be? Do I want to be in theta? Yes. Uh, so well, yeah, one. gorgeous. I love theta is just yummy, gorgeous place to be. By the way, two things. One, going into hypnosis is normal. We do it all day, every day. It's daydreaming. It's just so natural. First, so everyone can be hypnotized. And if they can't, if they say they can't, they're actually lying because we go into that state just before we go into sleep. So that's the first thing. The second tip I'm going to give you is remove the word try from that sentence. Oh, I'm going to go into theta state more often. Yes, because the brain registers try to fail. So if you say to a child, mm. try and jump over that puddle, they're more likely to fail than if you say to the child, Focus on jumping over that puddle. Wow. I need to get rid What's of the word try from my vocabulary. Ah, it can be useful. So I'll, I'll often say during hypnotherapy sessions, and if anyone's listening while they're driving, please just, just switch this off for just three seconds. Uh, you can put it on again later. I will often say to clients when they've got their eyes closed, okay, now try and open your eyes. The harder you try, the more they want to stay closed. and Every single time for thousands of sessions, every time they've kept their eyes closed and they, oh, wow. and they haven't been able to open them because the brain registers the word tries to fail. So if you're saying, right, I'm going to try and ask for a pay rise, just take the word, I'm going to ask for a pay rise. Okay. That is, <laughs> that is an absolutely brilliant. The, the tips have been immense. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so Katie, one of the things we t tend to do at the end of an interview when we've had a guest on is we, we'll ask them a question uh, just to give us a little feel, a little bit more for you. So we are curious, as are our listeners, as to what you've been reading recently. Well, can I have two? You can have two. Because <laughs> you gave us so many tips, you can have two books. Oh, thank you very much. Well, the one I've been reading recently is Harv Ecker's Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Because he helps you understand the subconscious programs that you may have been running and what are some exercises you can do to change it. Now, being a hypnotherapist, I personally are taking every tip in the book and saying, right, I'm going to work on this with my hypnotherapist. I want to go deep and actually go right in and heal it right at the root. And he talks about it in a way that just makes, he's quite straight talking. It makes, just makes so much sense. So that's my money book. And the book, and I'm actually rereading this because I actually read it on my hypnotherapy training, which is much more spiritual. Is Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. I love this book so much. And I don't know what it was, but when I read this the first time, something mysterious happened. Something shifted in me. And I stopped worrying about the future. I stopped fixating on the past. I started to really be in the now. His other book's called The Power of Now. I personally prefer this one to start with, but, you know, they're both great. It brought me into now. And suddenly I started to get more client signups. I st things started to shift. I wasn't putting all of my mental energy into what if it's not going to work. And I just started to owe being present more. And so actually, interestingly, this created quite a big shift in me right. into more success. And it's a very conceptual book. Yeah. A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose by Eckhart Tolle. Fantastic. Right. Thank you very much for that. And so if, any, the, if anybody's been listening and they want to find out a little bit more about what you do, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Uh, best way is on Instagram. If they're on Instagram, the artist's hypnotherapist. Hmm. And... Don't be put off by the fact that I work with artists. Artists, I work with celebrities and creatives mostly, but I've been on a journey of entrepreneurialism and business. And I, there's so much that I, well, have to talk about on this topic. And if you're not on Instagram, then katiecrooks.com. 
Okay, well, I will make sure to put note, uh, links to all of that in the show notes. Katie, just thank you so much for being a fabulous guest and sharing all your hints and tips with us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. You two are both amazing. <laughs> we think you're pretty cool too, don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Definitely. It's been, it's been fabulous, actually, quite, you know, really makes you think. Yeah. Good. That's, yeah, that's absolutely my intention. I just, we've got to get the word out that, that I know it sounds very soapboxy, but y- you can change. <laughs> You're not stuck with the beliefs. Well, the note, the note what I've written down is just be mindful of how I use the word try. Yes. If that's that, the one takeaway. <laughs> uh-huh. It's written down really big and then I've drawn a square around it and decorated the outside of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Look, thank you very much to both of you. And thank you listeners for listening. And until next time, please do take care of yourselves.